Not all combinations of neutrons and protons can form stable nuclear structures. Let's take an example. Let's say that there is a nucleus which has mass number A is equal to 25. That means there are 25 particles inside the nucleus. And it is composed of neutrons and protons. In that case, what is going to be the number of neutrons and protons in a nucleus which contains 25 nucleons? Is it possible for there to be 24 neutrons and one proton inside the nucleus? Is it possible for there to be 23 neutrons and two protons inside the nucleus? What about the other combinations? We can go on and on. Is it possible for there to be one neutron and 24 protons inside the nucleus? In fact, out of all these 24 combinations of neutrons and protons, the vast majority of the combinations do not even exist in nature. Only probably two or three combinations actually do exist in nature. Why is it so? What is it that determines the number of protons and neutrons that exist inside a nucleus for a given mass number? The answer to the questions leads us to what is known as the NZ graph. The NZ graph is a graphical representation of all the nuclear species that exists in nature and whatever combination of neutrons and protons that exists inside them. So if I have a graph here where in the x-axis you have the number of protons and in the y-axis you have the number of neutrons, then almost all the nuclear species that exists in nature will fall in this particular region which is known as the NZ graph. The center of this particular region which I have drawn with a blue line is known as the stability curve. So stability curve basically corresponds to those nuclei which are at the center of this region which correspond to maximum stability or which correspond to highest binding energy per nucleon compared to the nearest neighbor. For example, if I take a nucleus falling on the stability curve, then this nucleus will have certain number of protons and certain number of neutrons. Then this nucleus will be more stable compared to some other nucleus which has the same mass number but it does not fall on the stability curve but rather it is a little bit further away from the stability curve, maybe somewhere here. Now the thing is, if the nucleus does not fall on the stability curve, it is far away from the stability curve, then that nucleus will be less stable compared to those nuclei which are falling on the stability curve. The further away a nuclei is from the stability curve, the less stable that nuclei is going to be and uh, it might undergo radioactive decay processes like uh, beta decay processes so that it can come closer to this kind of a stability curve. Now there are two observations of the NZ graph which can tell us a lot about what is happening inside a nucleus. So if you look at the graph here, I have drawn a dotted white line which is the n is equal to z line. So this is the line which is a theoretical line and it represents a line which has slope 1 or it represents those points where the number of neutrons and protons are exactly equal. Now this is a theoretical line and this is the actual nz graph. Now the first observation is basically related to smaller nucleus or nucleus having small size or less mass number. So for nucleus having less mass number or mass number less than around 20, then the NZ graph almost coincides with the N is equal to Z line. What does it mean? It means that for smaller nuclei, the most stable version of a nucleus is that which has equal number of neutrons and protons or rather which has a 50% 50-50 distribution of number of neutrons and protons. The second observation is that as the mass number keeps on increasing, the number of neutrons starts exceeding the number of protons. This is why the NZ graph or the stability curve starts deviating from the N is equal to Z line. And as the mass number keeps on progressively increasing, the difference between the number of protons keeps on progressively increasing. For higher mass numbers, the number of neutrons is quite large compared to the number of protons for those nuclear configurations which are stable. So these two observations can tell us a lot about what is happening inside the nucleus. The first observation that for smaller nuclear sizes the number of neutrons and protons are equal hints at the possibility of nuclear energy levels. So in the same way that in atoms electrons organize themselves in distinct energy levels, nucleus also has energy levels of its own in which neutrons and protons organize themselves in distinct energy levels of their own. Now neutrons and protons are fermions, so therefore no more than two neutrons or protons can be present in each given energy level because they follow the exclusion principle. Also, neutrons and protons are fundamentally distinct particles, so they will have two distinct energy levels of their own. 
Also for the case of convenience of discussion, I have assumed that the proton energy levels and the neutron energy levels are almost similar. Now in this case, I have taken an example in which the mass number is similar or same for both these configurations, which is 12, but the neutron-proton ratios are different in these two configurations. So in the configuration on the left hand side, you have mass number 12, but you have number of protons 5 and number of neutrons 7. On the configuration on the right hand side, you have number of uh, protons 6 and number of neutrons 6 and total mass number 12. And because of the way in which neutrons and protons organize themselves in uh, energy levels and because no more than two particles of the same type can exist in the same energy level, you find that in the case in which the, there is an excess number of neutrons, the neutron occupying the highest energy state is at an energy level which is greater than the highest uh, occupied state in this particular configuration. So you can conclude that in those cases when the number of neutron is in excess, the total energy of all of these particles will exceed the total energy of the particles in the configuration where the number of neutrons and protons is equal. So now what happens is that in uh, natural systems, systems tend to evolve towards those configurations where the energy of all the particles is minimum. And in this case, when number of protons and neutrons are equal, the energy of all the particles is lesser. And because of this, this configuration will be much, much more stable compared to the configuration on the left hand side. And this opens up the possibility of radioactive decay processes such as beta decay processes. So in beta decay processes you can have a neutron converting to a proton or a proton converting to a neutron now what is going to happen if an excess neutron of this configuration converts to a proton so if the neutron here the highest occupied neutron converts to a proton then that proton is going to occupy an energy state which is lesser than its corresponding neutron neutron counterpart. So in a way, a beta decay process will basically decrease the overall energy of this configuration and it will make it much much more stable. In fact, the nuclear species that we have taken here, boron-12, whenever it is formed in some nuclear reaction, uh, immediately undergoes beta decay process to become a much stable version which is the carbon-12. So as you can see here, whenever there is an excess number of protons or excess number of neutrons, then those excess number of particles increases the overall energy of the total particles of the system. And and therefore makes the system unstable. So those excess number of particles then might undergo beta decay process and then level the number of protons and neutrons. So this gives us an idea why the number of neutrons and protons are approximately equal in nuclei of smaller sizes. Now the second observation that for increasing mass number or larger nuclear sizes, the number of neutrons start exceeding the number of protons is basically because of a result and the differences in the forces that exist inside the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, there are two kinds of forces. One is the strong nuclear force, which acts between all kinds of particles and it is attractive in nature. It acts as a glue that holds the nucleus together. And the other is a Coulombic repulsion, which only exists between protons and it is basically trying to break apart the nucleus. Now the difference in strong nuclear forces and the Coulombic repulsion is that strong nuclear forces is very very strong only at extremely short distances or at distances which are a few femtometers. The Coulombic repulsion cannot dominate over the strong nuclear attraction at short distances. So for small nuclear sizes, all the different kinds of particles are very close to each other and because of that the strong nuclear force dominates over the Coulombic repulsion. However, when you have a large nucleus where there are a large number of neutrons and large number of protons, the nuclear size is bigger. And because of this, even though there is a strong nuclear attraction between any one particle and its nearest neighbors, however, there is no strong nuclear attraction between let's suppose one particle on one end of the nucleus and another particle at another end of the nucleus because the distances between these two particles now exceeds the range in which strong nuclear forces act. However, the Coulombic repulsion can still act between proton pairs which are nearest neighbors as well as proton pairs which are on the other end of the nucleus. So as you can see what happens, the strong nuclear force dominates in smaller sizes because it is active only at short distances. But as nuclear sizes becomes larger, it starts becoming less compared to the Coulombic repulsion which is now trying to break apart the nucleus. So therefore, you need an extra number of neutrons to so sort of compensate for the ever increasing Coulombic repulsion because excess number of neutrons means an excess of strong nuclear forces while the excess number of protons would mean an excess of Coulombic repulsion. So as the nuclear size keeps on increasing, you would require an excess number of neutrons compared to the number of protons to sort of compensate for the ever increasing Coulombic repulsion to end up giving you a stable nuclear structure. 
So these were two of the observations and two of their conclusions that we could derive from the NZ graph. Now let's go back to our previous question. Initially we asked a question that if the mass number is some random value like 25, then what is going to be the number of neutrons and protons? From this graph we can only see an experimental data. So this graph is basically a result of an experimental data. Is there a possibility for a theoretical prediction of this NZ graph? So what I mean to ask is, is there a given function which can represent Replicate this particular stability curve or if I input a mass number can I get an output of a proton number and a neutron number for the most stable configuration it's possible to do that by using the binding energy expression that we have obtained in the semi empirical binding energy formula in my previous video I obtained the semi empirical binding energy formula from liquid drop model and some of its corrections. If you're not familiar with this kind of an expression, you should look up uh, those videos. Uh, I'll put a link in the description. So this is a theoretical sort of a modeling of the binding energy of any given element having mass number A and atomic number Z. The first three terms are basically obtained from considerations of the liquid drop model of the nucleus, which is, includes the volume energy, the surface energy and the coulombic energy. And the last two expressions are basically uh, some corrections to the liquid drop model which includes the asymmetry term and the pairing energy term. If you are interested in what sort of these terms mean and how they have these kind of expressions please look up the previous videos. Now we can use this kind of a theoretical uh, uh, expression to get an idea about the stability curve of an NZ graph. So for a given fixed mass number you can have many different combinations of neutrons and protons as we have taken the example of mass number 25 you can you can you can maybe have 24 protons and one neutron and a lot of other combinations as such. However, vast majority of those combinations will lead to binding energies which are so less that they would not even exist in the first place. Only few of those combinations would have high binding energies that you will end up getting stable nuclear configurations. So if the mass number is fixed and we change the atomic number or we change the number of protons which is Z, then there is going to be a particular value of Z at which the the binding energy is going to be maximum and that would correspond to the most stable version of that nucleus. For other values of Z, you will end up getting less binding energy and less stable version of the nucleus. So basically, we want to find that value of Z for which the binding energy is maximum. And the easiest way to do is to maximize the binding energy with respect to the number of protons. If we do that, the binding energy will have a maxima at that value of Z which corresponds to the most stable version of the nuclei. So let's do that and see what we, what we get. So what we are going to do is we are going to do the derivative of the binding energy with respect to Z and then we are going to equate it to zero because that would give us the value of Z for which you have the most stable configuration. So if you do a derivative of this entire expression, you will see that the first term, the second term and the last term does not contain terms of Z. So therefore, they will all end up giving you zero minus zero and the last term will also be zero. However, there are terms involved in the third and the fourth terms we have to look into those so minus a by 3 capital a1 by 3 d by dz of z z minus 1 minus a4 by capital a d by dz of a minus 2z whole square plus 0 is equal to 0 so this becomes minus a3 by a 1 by 3 this expression becomes minus a 3 2 z minus 1 by capital A to the power 1 by 3 so this expression now can be written as 4 a to the power 4 capital A a minus 2 z is equal to a3 2z minus 1 by a to the power 1 by 3. So let's uh, bring this to the left hand side. You have uh, a3 by a4 and a capital A by a 1 by 3 is equal to so you have 4 a minus 2z by 2z minus 1. 
So approximately, I can say that this expression is half of a3 by a4, capital A to the power a2 by 3 is equal to a minus 2z by z. Approximately, I can assume that because since z would have some large number value, z minus half would approximately be equal to z. So this expression therefore becomes, since a is nothing but n plus z, so we can write from this expression that n plus z minus 2z by z is equal to or approximately equal to half of a3 by a4 capital A to the power 2 by 3 or this becomes n by z minus 1 is equal to half of a3 by a4 capital A to the power 2 by 3 or n upon z is equal to half of a3 by a4 capital A to the power 2 by 3 plus 1. Okay, so now we have uh, obtained a sort of an expression or a mathematical function uh, which can approximate the nz graph or the stability curve in the nz graph. So we know the values of a3 and a4. The values of a3 and a4 are So if I put the values of the constants A3 and A4, A3 corresponds to the Coulombic repulsive energy term and A4 represents to the asymmetric energy term, then the expression for n by z will look somewhat like this. Now this is not a necessarily an exact form but based on maximizing the binding energy we can use this as an approximation of the stability curve and we can represent it in a, mathema in a graph and graphically plot the nz graph from this expression. So here I have written a very simple program on Scilab to try to replicate the expression of our n by z that we have just now obtained. If I run the program, it will start plotting me first the n is equal to z line and this is the stability curve corresponding to the nz graph. As you can see for very uh, small nuclear sizes, the stability curve sort of coincides with the n is equal to z line. And then after a while, as the mass number progressively keeps on increasing, the number of neutrons starts exceeding the number of protons. And this seems to be quite a good replication of the stability curve. Also, now we can answer our original question. So if you have some mass number, let's suppose A is equal to 25, then what is the most stable configuration for that mass number? So what is the number of neutrons and protons for that particular mass number? So we have this particular uh, uh, expression obtained from maximizing the binding energy that we have obtained, uh, which represents the stability curve or represents the most stable version of a given nuclei. So we only, all we have to do is just put up the value of A. So A is 25 in this case. If I put 1 plus 0 0.0156, and 25 to the power 2 by 3 then that would simply give us So putting up all of these values, we find that uh, this for A is equal to 25, you have Z is equal to 11.71. Now obviously the number of protons cannot be 11.71. So we can round off this number and we can write, let's suppose say 12 for this case. So basically the maximum value of binding energy for any mass number of 25 will be for that case in which it has 12 number of protons. So if Z is equal to 12, then in that case, obviously the number of neutrons would be uh, 25 minus 12 which is 13 so this leads to the configuration of magnesium which has 25 nucleons so for a mass number of 25 you have the most stable configuration for that case where there is 12 number of protons and 13 number of neutrons so as you can see we can uh, uh, we obtain the configuration of neutrons and protons or the neutron proton ratio which corresponds to the maximum stability for a is equal to 25 and you can do that for any other given mass number and we have uh, done that by simply maximizing the binding energy and then obtaining an expression which would best replicate or best approximate the stability graph of a z graph.